Hi, I'm John Popola, and you're listening to the Emergent Order Podcast. On this episode of the Emergent Order Podcast, I have a long and winding conversation with my good friend, Andrew Heaton. I first met Andrew through the casting process for a new show at the time called Econ Pop that we created here at Emergent Order. And you can see those episodes on our YouTube channel. Andrew came on board not just as the host of the show, but also a writer. And we even created a podcast, the Econ Pop podcast, that was also a great resource for interesting conversations about economics and pop culture. He has since gone on to be an internet personality, writ large, a political and sci-fi podcaster, and a new media entrepreneur. We talk about a range of subjects, starting with what it's like to do political comedy in the era of cancel culture, which really is a, an incredible challenge and a moving target for us in 2020. And so I hope you enjoy this wide ranging conversation with one of the smartest and funniest people I know, Andrew Heaton. <laughs> I, that is, man, that I, I, I finally got an external hard drive for my Mac it was driving me berserk because I, I'm on the road so much that I don't, you know, lug my desktop around and my, my Mac would fill up and I, I get that Macs are superior design compared to PCs, but I find them very difficult to navigate outside of like one of three designated tasks that Steve Jobs decided was important. And so you shut up. <laughs> I, oh, I just, I spent like, every, like <laughs> twice a week, my computer would go, Hey, Hey, I'm out of data. I don't have any more data and I'd like, I'd clear everything. And I, I would, I would, I, could, I had like five gigs under my control and everything else was, and I finally got an external a hard drive and I, I, my blood pressure has gone back down to normal. My ears have been attenuated where I actually can't hear criticism of Apple products. <laughs> so it's- Oh yeah, you got that Apple upgrade. Yeah, yeah, that's very good, yeah. <laughs> it's as if you were muted temporarily. That's fair. You know what I'll say is Apple, like the hardware's great. Like I, like I have never found hardware that works better longer than Apple. Like PCs will break down pretty quick compared to a, a, an Apple. That said though, I just like, I, I feel like my experience with Apple is being inside of this beautiful walled garden. I can't, and, and I'm like, hey, I need to do this thing outside the garden. And they're like, why would you ever want to leave the garden? And I'm like, I just need to go to my car. Can I go to my car? No, you can't okay, go give, to your car. If, uh, give, give me an example. Um, okay, so here's And one. I'm saying this is something, just, just for cred, ready? One uh -huh. second. Just, lest you think this is the only world I know. John built a robot. I have in my possession an AMD Ryzen processor. What's that? Which is for gaming PCs. Okay. All right. Okay. So you're, so you're, you're ambidextrous. I, I am. I, okay. I actually, I'm building. So I, I went on this uh, quixotic adventure where I, uh, I unearthed our old 2008 Mac Pros, which were these behemoths of cut from a single piece of aluminum mm -hmm. or aluminium as uh, they say across the pond. That's right. And, yeah. And, um, and I thought, okay, I have, I currently have my son gaming on a 2013 Mac pro, which looks like a trash can, but, <laughs> but is actually quite a good pro, pro computer for final cut and stuff like that. So I'm like, man, this is a waste of this machine. And it's getting so hot because all he's doing is running games all day long. So I thought I'll, I'll like give him the older computer, but it's so, it actually runs pretty well, but it can't, it's, we're now, it's, it's, it's 12 years old. Like the software updates, none of that's working. You, you, know, so. you know what's funny? My, my, my dad has like this built in, I don't want to call it, it's, he, he has a built-in fear of relinquishing obsolescent hardware because my, my dad, <laughs> like to his credit, he's a federal judge and he's learned how to use like, you know, various, like, like usually when, when public officials get a staff, they're done. Like they never learn technology again. The old congressman I worked for, uh, he still had a pager in 2010 because he, that's what he, that's what the technology he came in with. And like when he lost the election, his staff had to frantically teach him how to use an iPhone because he was trying to like push the buttons with a pencil. Like he had no idea how technology worked, right? So dad's done a pretty good job. That said though, like the stuff he uses it for is he basically uses email, Word, Netflix, 
and 1997 Hasbro Risk on CD-ROM. And he's afraid that it won't work well on other stuff. His, like fear, is, it, his fear is justified. Yeah, it actually <laughs> is because he, he finally put it on a new, a new laptop. And we were like, Dad, it's going to work fine. And the problem is that it, the, the processor is so fast that the, 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 this, the, the computer will go and it'll speed through all the decisions. So for, for a while, like I would come home years ago. This is like four years ago. And I go like, uh, Dad, your, your computer's not hooked up to the internet. And he's like, well, I don't use that computer for the internet. I'm like, what do you use it for? And he's like, that's for playing Risk. And he has like a whole <laughs> desktop PC in his office designed for a game that just works on CD-ROM. Like it's, he has a Risk machine that he plays with. It's a Risk machine that ha does he have like a CRT monitor? Is it like, so it's taking up like what is now more desk space than any computer takes up? <laughs> definitely takes up more desk space than anything else. Like he's got his <laughs> laptop from the courtroom that, that you know, is, is basically a pane of glass with a, with a typewriter or with, with a keyboard on it versus the risk machine, which takes it. And apparently, I just, I, he mentioned the other day that we've got our, uh, our 96 Acer up in the attic somewhere. And I'm like, I'm going to lug that thing down someday and turn it into like a cool historical display in my house. It's a box of hurt you're talking about right there. <laughs> oh yeah, That's I'm not going to use it. It's, <laughs> it's just, a box of pain. It's like, it's, oh, pain has been made physical. It's this. Yeah, well, it's, it's like the equivalent of like, if, if I had like an old Acer. rotary phone or something and I was like, yeah, we're going to show what we, this is what I had. And then I'll use it, you know, I'll use it to punish my children. I'll be like, that's it. You can use any computer in the house, but well, or you, you, you can only use that one computer. You can play any game you want on that computer for the rest of the week, but you can't use the regular computer. You can't use the sex robot. Well, the latter, they will have found a way to use no matter what you say to them. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they're probably going to be ahead of me. I, I don't know when this is going to happen, but that's, yeah, touche. Yeah, yeah. That, it's not that there's going to be a virus that renders uh, humanity infertile or zombies. It's just that there's going to be these incredible sex robots and no one will be able to compete with those, but they won't be able to conceive. And so that'll be it. It'll be, it'll be, uh, what is, what was that film um, with Clive Owen? Uh, Child of Men, uh, ch Children of Men, Children yeah. of Men, be, yeah, ch Children, yeah, maybe. Uh, that's that was the, like Scott Adams had that hypothesis about 15 years ago that, that basically we the, the point at which we developed like realistic sex robots and, and like and I can't like somehow it wound up with all of the sex robots owning our lasers and living on the moon and he's like yeah that's that's the point at which like that's they it. just dispense with the remaining few Amish people that are still cronking uh, in, in the old school yeah that's probably so. Okay. Well, I hasten the day because I currently am living in a bubble, John, and I would sure love to have a sexual relationship with a robot. That sounds pretty good. That's an upgrade over my current things. Right. Robots can't get, uh, can't get coronavirus. So yeah, another benefit. For, for those of you that are not yet married with, uh -huh. a, with a partner that lives with you in quarantine, here it is. Here's the solution. Mm -hmm. One of the many social changes that are being hastened by the pandemic. <laughs> the shift to pure digital relationships, uh, autonomous relationships. So, um, wait, sir, so are we on right now? We're we're always on. We're <laughs> You're always recording. On. Okay. Oh, I'm glad I didn't say any racial epithets, John. You should have warned me in case <laughs> yes, I. Yes. When yes. I, before before we start talking in earnest about the interview, I just want to throw out these these ethnic groups I don't like. Glad <laughs> I held back. <laughs> well, I think by today's standards, saying that there's anyone that you like might be considered that's true might it's... be considered racism for failure to include those that were not in the list or something it's scary right? and it's scary and exhausting can I, you know can i say i, I want to say a nice thing though before we get too far into this for for people that listen to this podcast that don't know john I just want to say, John, you're a great guy. I really like you. And you've had uh, a wonderful impact on my life. You know, uh, some of the early comedic work that I got that I still hear from people from now. The people email me back as Econ Pop, and that helped me get involved with Reason, and it led to other projects. And so you helped me there. And then when I moved to Texas, I got to stay at your guest house, uh, your little pool house in your backyard. Like you, you, and it was great because not only did I have this really cheap rent in a new city, I, I kind of had like a built-in family. And I would, I would, you know, I'll be coming in with groceries and your wonderful wife, Lisa, would come out and go, we're about to play some board games. You want to come in? So I just want everybody to know, in, in, in case they don't personally know John, that he is a, a stand-up guy and I think a really rare combination of a, a talented filmmaker and entrepreneur and somebody that has 
um, very, very firm beliefs, but at the same time, an extremely likable, friendly personality. And that's rare. And I like that about you, John. Well, I will accept all of those compliments. Good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, uh, well, that's super nice of you to say, Andrew. Uh, the, so the, the thing that um, has continued to strike me about you is that it is, it is hard to be funny in general. Thank you. And it's yeah. especially hard to be funny and retain any sort of philosophically interesting um, perspectives, especially now. So it's like, in a way, like, you know, you're a comedian, you have a political bent, mm -hmm. though um, I'd say political less in the D's versus R's and more in the what are the good ideas that can make the world a better place kind of politics. Very much so, em emphatically so. I, I try to avoid the, the red team, blue team slap fight much as I can, and I think so it's stupid. How are you, uh, how are you confronting cancel culture? Hmm. Well, the, the first thing that, 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 I've, that I'll say that I've become aware of over the last few months, and it was a really big light bulb moment for me, was when I realized that my podcast audience is different than random strangers who hate me on Twitter. Like, it took, like I know that that's like a very basic thing that everybody listening's like, obviously, for some reason, I didn't figure that out. I thought it was all one big soupy mess. And uh, I, so I, I host a show called The Political Orphanage, which is a uh, politics, news, and comedy show, about half of its comedy, about half of its policy analysis. You know, it's one of those. And <laughs> yes, uh, of course, I like, I like a... I like a 65-35 split between right. comedy and policy analysis and which side is which depends on the week. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, 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 actually what I do now is I do kind of the flagship episode on Wednesdays where I talk about Thomas Hobbes or I, I interview an author. And then on Fridays, I just bring on comedians to kick headlines around. So it's, it's very well organized. You never have to debate you know, where, where it is. <laughs> but, but it took me a while to realize that, yeah, that, that audience is very different than the cancel people. I think if I were, um, you know, 10 years further down the line in my career and I had like a huge following and people knew who I was that, that you know, hate me, but don't know me, uh, but know of me, then it might be more of an issue. But, but at present, I, I kind of realized that um, podcasting, I have the ability to contextualize everything I say. I can, like, I just did an episode on my show on, on the culture war. And, uh, and it's, it's a solid hour of me monologuing about it. And, I, if, if anybody listens to it by the end, they might well disagree with me, but I, I, you'd have a very difficult time listening to that entire hour and then going, yeah, Heaton's a whore. Am I allowed to swear? I don't know what the rules are on this podcast. <laughs> Heaton's a horrible person. Yeah, what a right. knuckle dragging bigot that guy is. I don't think anybody's going to come up with that. And, and so I, I, what, what your, I have your, done is- Your charitability is, is shining through as, <laughs> as bright as the sun with that. With that well, uh, but I do think it would if I, if I were popping off on, on social media. And I think social media is actually the bigger threat for people like me that are kind of mid-career or, or kind of middling level uh, where we, we don't have swarms of angry- you know, flying monkey, hall monitor, cancel culture, locust type people trying to destroy us because we're not on their radar yet. Uh, we get on the radar through social media and I, and I, social media, I've just kind of soured on for politics because I don't, I don't think that I've ever had my mind changed on anything important through Twitter or Facebook, uh, but I think it's right. probably done a pretty good job of shoving me into whatever bunker I was already holed up in. So I've just kind of quit uh, like, like really talking about politics on it. I like, I like doing it in podcast form and I like doing it in personal form. Um, but that, that is already just kind of a load off my mind of like, okay, if I get to the point where people try and cancel me, uh, then that's probably a good thing, uh, that I'm, that I'm actually making that many ripples. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah. So I, um, it's a very strange time to think about like what to do if you're, if you're someone who's out there in the public domain in some sense trying to get ideas across because it seems like we're in a kind of anti-ideas mm. age it's a weird I, yeah. I, i've been reading this book uh the 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 revolt of the pub of the public by martin gurry which mm. if you haven't read it it's pretty great i'm gonna write that down the revolt of the public by Ma uh, martin gurry martin gurry and basically yeah. he, it was written in 2014 but he talks about that you know we we the thesis basically goes like this. Um, 
the information age that we're in where you basically can discover almost anything there's there's very little that that like the big powerful people can hide from us for very long whether it's abu Ghraib during the iraq war or the horrible nsa spying programs or or just the general incompetence of sort of technocratic leaders all um, those things are hoaxes john they're we all <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like that was just all, talking points it uh it, it's all been laid bare so the emperor has no clothes and and that butts up against this like kind of old he calls it like modernist government rhetoric of we're going to solve all your problems so the public hmm. believes that government and other and big entities but especially government can deliver happiness and fulfillment and equality hmm. it sees that it never does and it sees that these people that are in these institutions are all kind of like bumbling corrupt stooges and so it descends into this purely negation nihilism hmm, okay and um i mean i think cancel culture is like one of the many um outcomes of this this nihilism negation mindset but if you see it in all of these protests so you know i saw this interview of uh, folks in in the the seattle chop or Chaz or whatever they're calling it now right, and yeah. it was like okay so you're gonna get rid of all of the the government the police the prison system the courts the all and what and then what and what comes next oh well no, I, no I, how dare you even ask that question like that I, I, the solution will emerge democratically out of the destruction of all the stuff that we have and and the, the book makes a pretty compelling case that 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 sort of like we are only unified in what we hate mm. and there is no positive program on the other side of it you, you know the, the the group like i i think uh, as you pointed out early uh, in, in this interview, John, I don't, I, I really eschew red team versus blue team stuff. And I, and I oftentimes think that the, the fight is genuinely not along those lines, although it's construed by a lot of media as such. And I, I was thinking about this last week, the group that actually does just drive me crazy and it drives me nuts and I can't get into the mind space isn't a, it's not a political ideology, it's a mindset uh, that I have a very difficult time working with. So I, I love, <laughs> this sounds so dirty, I, I love ideated graphs. I love taking concepts and making multi-spectrum analyses of them, like the Nolan <laughs> square or something like that, right? So like if, 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 you're, if you were to have an, an x-axis and the x-axis is how, how systemic a thinker you are, how much you think sure. in terms of systems and universality versus how much you think in terms of anecdote and People. isolated situational incident. Yeah. And then the y-axis is how emotional and empathetic you are. Uh, and if, if you're on the underside of that, you're very unemotional and very unsympathetic, right? So, so libertarians uh, all are in the full Asperger's systems. Right. No yes, empathy. I was about to say there, there, there actually is some significant psychological overlap between autism and libertarianism uh, because autism tends to be uh, very, very systemic, uh, but but pretty low on on EQ, right? Um, I I would say I'm I'm both. I'm I'm pretty high on the EQ. I'm extremely systemic in my thinking. I'm I'm a, I'm a bleeding heart classical liberal, or however you want to phrase that, right? I'm a systemic thinker, but I'm I'm empathetic. I'm I'm three quarter Spock, one quarter McCoy. I've got I've got <laughs> some of that in me, right? I think yeah. I think you and I are in, are pretty close in this in this yeah. chart. I'd, but, put but that, so, I'd, I'd say that X axis is the Eleanor Roosevelt axis. Cause you know, she said, uh, you know, small minds talk about people, yeah. you know, and great minds talk about ideas. And so right. like people versus ideas, practical versus abstract. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, and, and, and I mean, the, the, the big thing for me, I think is just universality and equity. And, and by that, I mean, um, I am okay with revising the system. I'm open to changing the system, but it has to be systemic. It has to be universal. Like I am not okay with making different rules for black people and white people. That strikes me as inherently racist. We've been combating that for the last couple hundred years and we're backsliding in that. Seems regard. definitionally so. <laughs> yes. And, or, or like, like I'll give another example. So sus suspend, um, sus suspend any first principle objection you have to what I'm about to say. And, and just, we're just looking at it hypothetically, but let, let's say that there's a system where 
um, I'm, I'm like, hey, like uh, child care, ch- child leave is is equitable because, you know, like men and women both get f- four days after they have a kid that they can take off work or whatever, right? Um, and, and so therefore it's equitable. If someone were to approach me and go, I, I realize that that system in your mind is uh, universally distributed where everybody has the same rules, but the system itself benefits men because they don't tend to stay home as much. So we need to change mm-hmm. it. I'd be like, okay, let's talk about that. So maybe we should, maybe everybody gets a month or maybe, maybe couples split a month or something. I'm open to changing that. But the, the, the group that I can't fathom that drives me nuts are the people that aren't systemic. They're not logical. They're not rational and they're super emotional. And I can't argue with them because there's, it's hard to argue with, with confident stupidity it's hard to argue with emotional certitude when it lacks any type of, of rational framework or coherence. And, uh, and, and that group, and, and I, I, I put like AOC and Trump in that group of people that are, they're gut thinkers. They just really, truly believe whatever it is. We, you know, I know in my I gut. I got my neurons in my tummy. Neurons yeah, are in and my it, tummy. <laughs> and, and, and if you start talking to them rationally, they get offended that you would dare drag in logic to whatever it is they're angry about today. And it's and like, they just want to break stuff. They just want to knock stuff over and be a bull in a china shop and have, have, have hissy fits. And I'm like, and I'm, I've got too much Burke in me. I'm like, no, we got to fix the system. Like this, we got to, there's a hole in the ship. Don't sink the ship, fix the hole. Let's fix the hole in the ship. And like that, that is if the, we the, blow the Sisyphistic fate I am. If we blow up the ship, there will be all this wood <laughs> and then we can all vote for the shape the wood will take. But, but right. it needs to be only through direct, direct democracy with, with, with our hands moving like this. Because if, mm-hmm. we, if we yell aloud, that'll be triggering and it'll hurt my feelings and yeah. I'll feel unsafe. Well, and, and then like, like another thing, I so think that's that a problem. With, with, with the cancel culture, that, that I, uh, it's interesting that you bring up kind of modernistic government promises. I, I think that there's a real clash right now going on between liberalism and illiberalism in, in the old, yeah. old school sense of the word. And so like, I'm going to put myself very firmly in the liberal camp where I think ideas, bad ideas should be met with debate. Bad ideas, like, like sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? So I think of ideas as like, let's get it out in the open. Let's get it in a, in a, in a public forum. Let's debate it. And the dumb ones will probably die out and be ridiculed. And that's a very different mindset than approaching dangerous ideas as a pathogen. And that's, that's what we're seeing in this cancel culture, the idea that it's not that it's a bad idea, it's that it's a dangerous idea. And we have to snuff out this idea. We have to lance it where it is. And if you even, if you dare bring somebody on your program, we have to, uh, we have to boycott you and deplatform you because these things could spread like a virus. And, I, like, and that's just such a different way, an illiberal and regressive way of approaching uh, information in a free society. How... Um... It's, it is fundamentally illiberal. It doesn't seem like liberalism um, ha, liberalism as sort of a, a body of ideas and people that, that there has emerged a, uh, an answer to this yeah. because it's sort of an asymmetrical fight, right? It's like yeah. We, we liberals are out there saying we need, to, um, we need to put ourselves to the test. It's this competition of ideas that's like evolution. It's, evolu- it's the evolution of everything. So I'm going to say I think uh, we should you know, privatize the police as well as the schools. And you're going to say, well, maybe the police, but not the schools or neither or both or uh, you're wrong. Or, and we're, we'll, we'll hash it out. And we'll, and, and we'll hash it out in this, um, in this way that we both end up learning something. And maybe we don't, our minds don't change, but they, 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 do, they do still fundamentally change in some respect. If you come to understand another person's point of view, it, it will change you in some way. Maybe it doesn't change the position you hold, but it might change what motivates that position. You might find a different underpinning for your thinking or something. Hmm. That versus shut up right it's like nuance and and it's uncomfortable and uh, you know you won't always like it versus feel righteous and slay the demons and black black hats white hats and us versus yeah. them and um it's like our the it's like the reptilian part of the brain 
is is being given this like pseudoscience faux academic justification with all this um critical theory and all these things that try to say there's no such thing as logic it's all socially we're oh, all socially constructed God. or whatever whatever <laughs> it is that whatever it is that sort of I'm steps go punch in a wall to, <laughs> for a few minutes just hearing that hypothetical thought oh there's well, no just such like, thing as a logic there's all this like ex post stuff that gets brought yeah. in and to to try to justify what ultimately is might makes right right isn't that really kind of what that stuff is like cancel culture is might makes right like oh if we can shut you up that's justifiable because we did it isn't that what don't you think that's fundamentally what cancel culture is no, that, that's that's really interesting i haven't thought of it that way i will noodle that i i tend to think of it more like a a resurgence of religiosity i think that uh, you know the, the the general um the general assessment of, of particularly Europe, um, but, but the United States over the last 20, 30 years is that we're becoming increasingly secular and less religious. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think we've become less religious. I think organized religion has declined in number. But I think that, uh, and I say this as somebody that's a secular agnostic, I'm, I'm either a very secular Buddhist or I'm an agnostic, but I'm not like a church going dude. Um, I, I think religion is the default state for human beings and the predominant state for human beings. And there's quite a lot of people that would be what we would identify as a religious zealot that have those native impulses that have not tempered them or investigated them. And they are increasingly taking all of those impulses and moving them out of the religious sphere into the political sphere and making politics their religion. And the problem with that, in my view, is one, what a dismal religion to pick. At least if you were Mormon, you'd have a good barbecue. <laughs> Or if you were Catholic, you, you know, you'd get some, some good coffee hours out of it, some fun feasts and things. It's a, a dismal religion. But on top of that, you can be Catholic or Mormon or Jewish or Buddhist or whatever, and your religion is not predicated on a, uh, a yearly victory over the enemy. You, 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 know, you think you're right, all that stuff. But it's not like, I was religious for a long, long time, and I, we, we never had the priest come in and go, guys, we got to beat them Muslim come November, they are going to destroy, like that just wasn't part of the mindset. And when it gets into, um, when it gets into the, the, the cancel culture and, um, and, and how ideas operate, uh, I, I think that there's a, a strong vein of blasphemy and heresy at work. Of You're right. There's all the things, there's, there's religion, there's a, there's um, dogma, there's original yeah. sin, there's yeah. catechisms. It's, it's, um, and in blasphemy in particular, because there's, there's a difference, there's a, a great Thomas Sowell quote. In fact, hold on, I can read it for you. Uh, Thomas, I happen Thomas to Sowell, have it right here. I happen to have it right here. Too many people today act as if no one can honestly disagree with them. If you have a difference of opinion with them, you are not considered to be in error, but in sin. And I think that those are quantitatively different states. It's very different to tell somebody that they're wrong versus they're willfully evil. And that changes the whole matter of debate. Do you think um, that this uh, this impulse to say the other side is isn't merely confused or maybe has a different means to the same end, but that they're evil? Is it there is a slight there's like a pleasurable trigger in in saying I'm the righteous one. And oh yeah, and those other people that don't think like me are actually Satan, right? I mean, I, I am guilty as charged. I have felt that way. I've looked at some of the, the things that people say that I think are terrible ideas and say, well, they're just, they're just evil. They just want to destroy the society. That's just, just like, why would you think that? Like, how could you possibly believe that that's a good idea? Look at yeah. a history book. Have you read any books? Um, and that, uh, it, it, it does. It, like, it, it gets you kind of pumped. Yeah, and I, you're right. Social media supercharges that because it sort of strips all the rest of the uh, texture away of having to look people even in the virtual eye. Um, and and self righteousness is beguiling. I mean, self righteousness is easy to get addicted to. And, and like the other thing too is that we're the 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 difficulty for the liberal position that we're describing that that embraces pluralism, which is another thing, by the way, to get to the the religious element. There's a very big difference between pluralism and religiosity because if, if you're if you're in this zealot sphere of things that are wrong are an affront to the universe they must be stepped out it's very different pluralism is not even really 
uh, like evolution of ideas. It's an acknowledgement that you're wrong and I'm fine with it. Like you're just flat out wrong, but you can be my neighbor. And like pluralism is, I think, a difficult state to maintain. It takes a little bit of effort to maintain that, to, to look at somebody and go, God, you're an idiot. Okay, let's get a hamburger, right? Like that's, that's a tough thing to do. Uh, with with the, the self-righteous kick that's in there, yeah, I, I think that in the same way that people have a, a default religious state, uh, and, and my idea would be to try and funnel that into positive things, either through your own church community or alternately, if you want to join the Rotary Club or something, find community there, find meaning and purpose outside of politics, try and make politics smaller in your life rather than bigger. I, I think that that all kind of is amplified by this deep tribalistic impulse that we have as human beings. When I started comedy, I knew getting into comedy that everybody relates to uh, death and sex. I knew that that was a commonality. I think most people know that, right? Even monks kind of fear death. You know, if a, if a tiger came up, they'd be afraid of the tiger and maybe they'd get a direction at some point. We don't know, right? Uh, what, what I hadn't predicted was just how massive the tribal impulse is in people. And when I think back on, back when, when stand-up comedy clubs existed before COVID, yeah, uh, right, I never... Right. I never got in trouble. Uh, I mean, I'm not particularly edgy, but I never really got in trouble for making jokes about sex or death or, or swearing or anything like that. But if I started poking at people's tribal identity, like if somebody was wearing a jersey for a team and I was like, oh, Oklahoma City Thunder, like, is everybody there from Oklahoma City? Well, they moved from Washington. Well, but the owners surely must be in Oklahoma City. Oh, like one of them lives in Portland and the other one's in New York? Oh, okay. <laughs> like when you start doing that, people want to kill you with a rape. Like they like people get really worked up about that. And I, that, that tribal impulse is so built into us. And I, I, it's in me. I think it's in you. I think we all have that. I don't think that it's, it's like, I don't think it's a learned behavior. I think that it is an innate behavior, but what we can do is at least instead of openly pandering and flaming that impulse, uh, we can at least try and funnel it better. Like, like we all have sexual impulses, but like, I don't like tumble around with people naked on the road i at least have the dignity and self-respect to find like take it you know, inside yeah like, like the, the back of an suv or something in a denny's parking lot where no one has to watch it you know like i could i could at least do that or like you know i'll, I'll eat food but i'll eventually quit eating oreos but the, the tribalism thing i don't think people quite realize how destructive that is for for society as a whole in how personally destructive it is if you get if you get addicted to rage that's not good for you or if you uh, you, you, you get a, addicted to, you know, just this, this big old tribal flush. I, I think like contempt, uh, something that Arthur Brooks talks about quite a lot. Uh, contempt is yeah. extremely corrosive, not just to society, but to you as a person, it would be better for you not to be contemptful. You can be passionate. That's fine. Argue. That's great. We need more passion, but don't be contemptful. The, uh, so let's, let's go all the way back because I am curious I don't even think we've really talked about this. Uh, wh what was your first moment of wanting to pursue comedy? When did that first become even the glint of a thing for you? I think the glint of a thing, you know, I, I, I had been writing, I've been working on, I, I, start, I wrote a novel when I was in high school. It's not published because weirdly enough, my, my high school debut novel <laughs> was, was not Ooh. as up to snuff as the you know, international mega bestsellers that have subsequently followed. Uh, but, I, but I worked on that. I was very much affected by uh, Douglas Adams and, and several other humorists. And so was already kind of viewing myself in a comedic capacity as a novelist. When I got into college, uh, I, I kind of became the Craigslist version of Dave Barry at my university, like I like I, I wrote I wrote a bunch of very boilerplate, stupid political columns that like I'm not. It's not even that they're embarrassing. They're just like very, the college paper. Like what yeah, were you the college paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 uh, the Oklahoma Daily, and uh, and I was you know I was writing stuff about abortion, and everything like everything that you that, that, a, that a freshman should be writing about. And then I wrote some article about like Valentine's Day, and I like there was some line in it about like I like my my date was so mad at me that she made me pull out of the drive through or something like there was some throwaway line that illustrated like that clearly this was a bad date and, and the, the article very much of that timbre and it got a, a ton of really good response of like this is great keep doing this and I was like okay and I, I kept doing that it was like oh I, I actually kind of like this I, I prefer doing the funny stuff and I, I, I had a disservice done to me, or, or rather, I guess I should say, I wish that I had the, the leg up that I think people that go to, say, uh, Harvard or, um, or Emerson have, 
where like it should like if you go to Emerson where you're you, you know you 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 pre you you major in Hollywood I think that you you go in knowing you can have a job in entertainment I didn't know that I grew up in Oklahoma uh, I grew up surrounded by cows and my dad is a federal judge so I that was not a part of my universe growing up it didn't even occur to me that I could make it, money it could be a show now though Yes, it could be. Yeah, it could uh, be. Ju Judge Cow would be, a, I think, a great yeah. decent Netflix special. Um, so, so I, I was interested in it, but I was very, very hesitant to embrace it in any capacity. I, I, I started doing. I, I, I went to Washington D.C. and I, I worked for Congress for a little while uh, as a staffer, and I was doing stand up at night and uh, enjoyed it, and you know, was was really getting into comedy and really studying it hard and listening and reading books and working on jokes and things and, and doing the, the heavy lifting you do when you're, you're beginning to learn that craft. And then I got a master's degree in Edinburgh and I, was, I kept doing comedy while I was in Edinburgh. In fact, I think I reached the apotheosis of my stand-up career while I was there because at one point I was the designated comedian at Saturnalia Cabar Cabaret and I went up to tell jokes in between a guy that ate light bulbs and a woman that took her clothes off. And I think that was like the highlight of <laughs> my it. comedy career. That was the peak. That was the, that peak, was the peak for stand-up anyway. Def definitely peak Keaton for stand-up purposes. But Were you that, dressed like Adam Smith? Uh, I, th I think I probably wore smoking jackets. I don't remember exactly, but, but I, you, can, <laughs> you can get away with wearing an ascot in Scotland in a way that you can't in Oklahoma. <laughs> like, like in Oklahoma, you're either at a Halloween party or you're just sort of baiting people to take a swing at you. Whereas in Scotland, they're like, I guess he's, he's either at a fancy dress party or maybe he's a lord. I don't know. Um, but I did, when, I, when I went back to, I went back to DC and I remember distinctly being in Edinburgh preparing to return to the States and, and walking around uh, and, and thinking, gosh, I, like I, you know, I, just, I just worked for Congress and I spent a year uh, getting this, this uh, master's degree in international politics and, and international political economy. And I would actually rather be a comedian. And I, uh, um, and, and I, I buckled, I cowered it out. Uh, I, I knew that the next step was, was to skip the political thing and go to New York or go to, to LA. But I went back to DC anyway and had this incredibly like bureaucratic procedural outlook of, well, I'm going to get a job, you know, probably at a think tank, maybe with the State Department. And I'll do that until maybe I'm 40, and then I'll see if I can't transfer to New York City. And then at that point, I'll be able to pursue stand-up comedy full-time. And fortunately, I sucked was... at getting it. I, I just I sucked at getting any type of responsible adult job in DC for whatever purpose. I wound up, I was there for a year. I mean, this plan really, when you describe it, was ludicrous. Did you not at the mo at that point say, okay, I, my path to comedy is through the State Department bureaucracy. That, right. that, that, that didn't well, give you any pause it, at the time? <laughs> it, 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 was, it wasn't that I thought it was a good path. It's that I was so risk averse at the time. And I, I yeah. did not realize that I could do that. Uh, fortunately, I, I sucked out. I ended up not getting a job at a think tank. I got turned out at all the think tanks. <laughs> shout out to Cato. Uh, shout yeah, out to these like, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You're funny. I, 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 I wound I up, uh, I became a Segway tour guide. And I did that for about six months that I was like, if I'm just doing random weird jobs, why don't I just go to New York and do random weird jobs up there and do comedy? And so I did. And I ended up getting hired in TV and working as a television writer for a while and, and really getting absorbed into the New York comedy scene. And at some point when I was in New York, I was like, oh, I can actually, oh, people will pay me to be funny. I can do that. It took me till I was about 30 to figure that out. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but now I'm, you, you can argue I'm not very good at it, but I am paid to be funny. That is how I make my living. Well, I am um, the, the political side, though, the policy side, the like the the how you are, how you're having fun being funny in school, mm -hmm. having that stay with you. And yet you go to Edinburgh and you study political economy. Where Where was that? Was it because your father was a federal judge and you were sort of was politics and sort of big idea talk in the air at the Heaton house? How, how did, where did that come from? Cause, cause these are the two, you know, co-conjoined pads in your, in yeah. your story. Yeah. And I didn't even realize, I mean, it, it wasn't until I, um, I'll say incidentally, it, it wasn't until I read Parliament of Whores by PG O'Rourke. Uh, like I, I read that book when I got back to DC and I was like, wait a minute, you can do, you could be funny and do politics. 
and you don't have to be a registered Democrat? <laughs> no, why didn't nobody tell me this? It was a really big light bulb moment for me, but I didn't even, like, it didn't even occur to me prior to that moment that I could combine the two and do political comedy. I thought they were completely asunder. The, the political thing was, was much more in the water where I was growing up. So yeah, dad, dad is a federal judge. He was in the state legislature when I was a kid. Um, uh, and so we were prone to have, you know, abstract political conversations about political ideology and that kind of thing. I was really interested in it in high school and then in college. Uh, in college, I was in a, a um, uh, kind of the, the student mouthpiece to the state legislature. I wound up being governor of the thing. It was kind of, I, I was really on path to be a politician and in a extremely, extremely rare moment of humility when I was about 22 went, I don't know anything. Like I don't like I'm not married. I don't know what a mortgage is. I don't know how mortgages work. Like why? Like because like like it's not uncommon for state legislators to you know run at 22 or 23. Like that happens a lot of the time. Uh, and I, I, I was, can help design your life for you. Yeah, I, or maybe exactly. I can help. Yeah. I can figure out how to design my life. But by starting with yours. <laughs> right. And I'll get a See? title and I'll get to wear a suit. And I, yeah, and I, I went, yeah, I, I went maybe in the future. And I'd, you know, someday, honestly, like when I'm, when I'm fully rooted and I've got a house and a mortgage and I've been in a place where I would love to be in the state legislature just because I, I enjoy policy so much, but I'm, I'm, I'm holding back. But, but yeah, at the time I was like, I shouldn't do this. So I kind of pulled out and was like, I guess maybe I'll work for the State Department. And then at some point went, you know, it's way more fun to just throw rocks at this than it is to, uh, than it is to you know, right. actually do it. Um, although I got to say the downside is like, I, you know, I, I really enjoy and I will, uh, I will, I will uh, invert that humility that I just displayed. I, I just, I, I enjoy and I think I'm quite good at, at being funny at policy work. So not just like a, uh, like, you know, like the Daily Show is much more of a making fun of the news, whereas John Oliver is making fun of policy and he's elucidating that. And I'm, I'm quite good at the John Oliver type stuff. At one point, uh, his show reached out to me uh, to invite me to apply as a writer. Uh, and uh, I, I like doing that. And it's, it's pretty difficult to do it right now because like, yes. like I, I approach it like either an engineer or an attorney, an engineer in the sense that, hey, like, let's fix stuff. This isn't about which team we're on. This is about problems and solutions to problems. And here's my solution. Let's hear your solution. Let's work it out. Or like an attorney where it's like, I, I am representing this view. I believe this thing. You're representing that view. You believe that thing. This is not an assessment of our character. It's not a referendum on who we are as people. Yeah. It's just, we're having this dispassionate argument. And that is not the environment that we're in right now. And I, I have found it, I got to say this last four years has been difficult socially in that uh, pre-Trump I could, you know, I could do funny videos for reason and stuff. And it was like, no one really cared. And then like dating just nosedived the, the day that Trump was elected, because of course I'm evil. Uh, and, uh, or, or at least I'm not sufficiently angry or whatever. And, uh, and yeah, then, why like, don't you think fascism has arrived in America? Uh, right. And, and yeah. you're like, like, I mean, part of that's my fault. I didn't realize that 99% of the time when people tell you they want to discuss politics, they're, what they're saying is I want to exchange emotional states with you. And I'm actually like, I'm trying to like, oh, cool. Well, I read this book by Rutger Bregman recently that I thought was it like, that's not, yeah, no one yeah. wants to do that. But, uh, but it's- Some, uh, there it, are those that do, but man, you got to hold them tight yeah, when you yeah, find them. Yeah. I, I mean, I have, I have worked out strategies to get around that, but, but I will say that like um, career wise, it's, it's something that I think about a lot because I'm aware that the longer I do political media, it, like if, if I really, like if, if this next year, if I were to go, all right, no holds bar. Let's just do political comedy. That's all I'm doing. And I'm really going to own it. It's probably going to close doors for a ton of other stuff that I kind of want to do. And it's sad. I don't think it should be that way. You know, it's funny because it's funny because what's happened is political comedy has become all political and not that much comedy. It yes. feels like to me. I, like when, I, I rather agree. I think Clapter has become the, yeah. the operative phenomenon of the day. And I, I, it is, um, it's a bummer because the comedy part is the part that's actually truly enjoyable and broad. And, mm -hmm. you know, when there's like such a, there is this divide, I think, in a way. It's like the, you had the Jon Stewart era where of, the, of like modern political comedy and then, and now we have the Stephen Colbert era. 
and the Stephen Colbert the, the new era. Stephen Colbert, not the yeah. old Stephen yeah, Colbert, because yeah. the old no, no, Stephen Colbert no, was No, there was awesome. the interregnum of Stephen Colbert, you know, pretending to be yeah, Bill there's, O'Reilly. There's, there's, you know, there's conservative Colbert, there's bearded Colbert, which lasted about three months. Well, <laughs> and, then, and then there's new Colbert, which is much more focused and anti-Trump and, and clapter oriented. And, and yeah, and this, uh, this clapter thing, this, this like, uh, the key here is to get my audience who is already sort of a sycophantic self-selection group to clap at me. Like what a weak benchmark to cross. Like, okay, uh, yeah. I have a studio audience that's coming to see the stuff I do. And I actually have staff that's gonna tell them to clap, but getting them to clap. It, it and I'll add to that a talented staff because I know several of Colbert's writers and they're very funny, very talented comedians. And one of the frustrating things that I find as a comedian is I know all these funny, talented people and regardless of where they are politically, it, it saddens me that they're, they're being corralled into this one specific lane of jokes instead of really displaying their wares that I know that they have. And uh, I, like, I, I think Colbert's an extremely talented, funny comedian, but I haven't watched him in a couple of years now because I was like, yeah, I get it, Trump's dumb. Like, I, I agree. I also don't like Trump, but can you please tell jokes about bears again? Like, I like it. Yeah, I, th well, that, I, there's a lot of that. I, um, I don't, I'm not a comedian, uh, although I've directed a lot of sort of comedic work. And one of the things I feel like is essential to and I, I'd be curious how, what you think about this, but I think that one of the fundamental things in comedy, uh, I, I think of it as being there's sort of two different buttons you can push. Um, you can either push comfort or discomfort. Mm. And so what I mean by that is Seinfeld or Sebastian Maniscalco or, um, or Louis C.K., or well, Jim mostly, Gaffigan. yeah, or Jim Gaffigan, yeah. hot pockets. Like you're pushing comfort. You're push. You're you're sort of um, telescoping into the familiar and finding the humor in that shared experience. Like, oh, my mother is also loud, and I right. laugh about it, and it's familiar and it's comfortable. Men and women are different. D yeah. Dating is <laughs> yes. dating's yes. weird. Yeah. Anyone that, you know, like the blank slate hypothesis doesn't survive any encounter with a child, <laughs> a singular child. Um, and then you have the discomfort lane, which is a, a whole range of things. Like at, at the far end, I put absurdism. So just I'm way off. I'm being knocked totally out of kilter. It's coming out of nowhere. It's the, it's, um, you know, panning over in the courtroom scene and the, and the, and the, uh, the Kool-Aid man breaking through the wall, like it's the unexpected, but it's also, I think like po political humor has shifted from the discomfort zone, George Carlin, to the comfort zone if you're in the group. And I, like, and the discomfort zone is where I think it's much more interesting, where I'm, yeah. I'm putting you all out of your comfort zone. I'm, um, I'm telling you an, a, a, a difficult truth in a funny way. And the comfort zone is I'm just sharing. I'm just, we're just sharing our, it's the same thing as making Italian jokes about eating pasta all the time. And ha ha ha, it's true. We do eat pasta all the time. And, and uh, I don't know, what do you think of that as like a model? Uh, I think it's a very interesting one. I, like, I, I think... Um, I wouldn't say it's exclusively correct, but I think that you've definitely struck onto an extremely useful binary uh, of, of, you know, comfort versus discomfort. Uh, one, one of my friends, I think would agree with you that, that I know from the New York comedy scene, and his theory is that in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, uh, society was a big safe place where you weren't supposed to, you didn't really talk about politics that much. And, and it was sort of, you know, a lot more conformist and a lot more, particularly if you were, you know, a white guy like me, like your, your opinions weren't challenged that much, right? And so people went to comedy clubs to see Lenny Bruce and George Carlin, because that right, was right. where their worldview was challenged. And he thinks that the model is now inverting, where the society itself is so loud and angry and argumentative that people are turning to comedy for their safe space. Um, now, whether or not it, you have to be in group or not, I don't know. I mean, I feel like Jim Gaffigan's pretty universal in that regard. 
Um, as far as like, it's interesting that you would, you would put absurdity in the, the discomfort camp because I like, I find that I'm tacking more and more towards absurdism uh, because I find that absurdism sort of allows me to avoid ridicule. Uh, because ridicule, one, it, I just find ridicule a bit more exhausting. I don't personally like doing character attacks so much, but also when it's targeted, uh, like I am now making it very much an us and them type thing. And so I like doing, like I, I do on, on my show, like I, I do a series of commercials on most of the programs and they're for weird, absurd products like the the piano bicycle, you know, for when you want to go on a bike ride, but also you want to play piano. And I, and I enjoy going to the absurdism, but it's kind of a way of, I, I feel like giving everybody a little bit of a vacation when I do it from, you know, we've, we've been doing this very analytical stuff and, and we, we're, we're wading into politics, which is so combative. So we're just gonna go on this bizarre Monty Python-esque world building experiment that I have done. So the reason why I put absurdism in the discomfort camp is less about, um, it's, it's discomfort of a different sort. So it's discomfort of, and this is, this is like my video editor in me, it's discomfort of pace. Oh, okay. It's, yeah. syn it's it, uh, absurdism. I always think of as being fundamentally syncopation. It's right. placing the beat at the wrong spot. Right. Yeah. So the comfort yeah. of a melody that's predictable, that's comfort from a pace perspective. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and, and that's the, why, why like, uh, yeah. like air, airplane, like I love airplane. I love <laughs> Leslie Nielsen movies. I love the naked gun. And what, what I love about them is that they're like, they're kind of crazy, but they're crazy the same way that like, eight-year-olds are crazy. Like, I feel like every Leslie Nielsen movie was basically yeah. arrived at by taking two hyper-confident 10-year-olds and going, hey, guys, make a scene about a date. And they're like, well, I know that, you know, adults drink uh, out of wine glasses on a date, but I like chocolate milk. So they're drinking, you know, chocolate milk out of wine glasses. And uh, I know that adults like sex. So uh, they'll, they'll just be, you know, they, they'll, they'll have sex separately in separate bathrooms and like, like things like it. But it, so there's like enough logic that you can follow what's happening, but it's discordant yeah. enough that it's funny and it triggers that surprise thing. I, I also wonder, John, like, like something that I think about a lot is, can, can I pitch another ideated graph at you and the audience? Have I, have I exhausted <laughs> yes, please, my, please, great, please. thank you. And okay, so, so can, can we get a Venn diagram in here at some point during our conversation? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, can, I think I can do the Venn diagram. I, I do less of those, but um, I think that- These are could... always best done verbally, by the way. So that's yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah, 100%. <laughs> we'll, we'll have Jesse throw in some like zwing sound effects for what I talk about the X and the Y uh, so that the people can follow it. Um, like, I, I think that there's, there's so much uh, um, incorrect flashpoints right now predicated on whether you are socially liberal or socially conservative. And I don't think that's where the battle lines really are. I think that if, if you were making an X to Y or a, an X axis of, of whether you're socially liberal to socially conservative, and I'm socially liberal, there's a, an intersecting Y axis, and you see this in comedy as well, of compliance. How important is compliance to you? And if you're on the top end of that, you're a nonconformist and you're rankled by, uh, by other people telling you how to act or talk. Even if you agree with them, it bothers you. And if you go really high on that, you become a troll. And you enjoy, you know, uh, you enjoy irritating people yeah. and bucking norms. And the further down you go on that axis, the more important compliance is to you. The more important it is that we have polite society. And in our polite society, we don't say but, or we don't use incorrect pronouns, or whatever that thing is. And, and you, you see, like in, in Christians, it manifests as, or conservative Christians, it manifests as, um, you know, certain wording that you can or can't use, and topics you can and can't use. And progressives, it does the exact same thing. And I see this in comedy, where, where there's this, this weird division between um, stand-ups and improv. And I'm getting nitty-gritty here, but stand-up comedians tend to be a pretty non-compliant group of people. Yeah. Uh, regardless, like in stand-up comedians, also, like, pretty heavily progressive comparatively, but just, but they're, they're progressive. They believe all that stuff, but they don't like thought policing, or I should say, we don't like thought policing and we don't like, um, we don't like verbal hall monitors. We, we cause we're, we're the class clowns that, that grew up. Uh, whereas improv people tend to be on the flip side of that, which I find is improv people are much more touchy feely and I like improv people, uh, but they're much more touchy feely. They're much more, um, group oriented. And there's this whole like kind of, uh, comedic ethic that has developed separately in these two groups where stand-up comedians oh, will typically have their own, um, we, we all have our own internal rubric of whether something's offensive or not. And for comedians, it's usually based on intentionality uh, and for, for stand-up comedians, intentionality. Whereas for improv people, it tends to be based on impact. 
So if, if I were, if I had a joke in a stand-up comedy routine about the defenestration of Prague and after the show, a guy came up and he went, you know, you told that joke about the defenestration of Prague, but my uncle killed himself by jumping out of a window. I, as a stand-up comedian would be like, I'm very sorry to hear about your uncle. Clearly I was not making fun of you and your uncle. I did not know that. I'm going to continue doing this joke. <laughs> although, you know, maybe I'll buy you a drink or something. Whereas right. an improv person would be like, I am 100% wrong. You were offended and you are, you're experiencing an emotional state and therefore I'm, I'm wrong and you're right. And, and so you, you see these, these variances. And I think where it gets really interesting is when you get um, like super socially liberal slash super nonconformist people. Like uh, I'm friends with a comedian named Leo Kurse, who's a, a, a Scottish comedian of the year. And Leo did a whole show that he got banned for <laughs> from a series of, uh, and from comedy, where a, for, a from, comedy from show or comedy a country? Clubs. Oh, for, well, I think both. Well, he he came back down to Australia, but his his show got banned from several Australian comedy clubs. It was, it was called Transgressive, and it's about transgender people. And he didn't use the right pronouns, and he didn't correctly speak about these people. But the thing that really should be mentioned about this this evil conservative show that Leo did was that he wrote it with his transgender girlfriend. Like he he wrote this whole set with a transgender woman, however you want to phrase this. So clearly he's okay with them because he was very public and open about it and very supportive of this lady. It's just that he doesn't care about pronouns. He just doesn't, he's like, well, what you want me to say? I don't care about what you want me to say. I'll say what I care. No, I don't do that because I'm not a Maoist. Like, and so <laughs> it, it's this weird thing where he gets like castigated as this bigot, but it's like, he's literally publicly in a romantic relationship with this person you think he's making fun of, it's just that he doesn't care about language rules because he's not a hall monitor. Well, it's interesting that you, and you prob you're probably tapping this intention versus impact uh, uh, pretty carefully, right? Because that is um, even I, and I'm not some legal expert, but I, my understanding is that that's actually like an important legal distinction. You know, hmm. uh, uh, whether or not, you know, you have to prove intention in mm -hmm. crime, not just impact. And the shift, mm -hmm. and when we say impact, it's, you know, to sort of break this down for the listener or viewer, it's like, okay, so I make a bad joke and I don't care, and it's whether or not I intended to hurt you. Right. That is whether, that de defines whether I'm being a good person or, or that, that makes jokes that are offensive or being a terrible person that hates you. And it's such a, sh the sh that shift to judging everything on impact is <sighs> really. And, and taking it hyper literally and assuming that everything is some sort of philosophical exegesis rather than so, just a joke. So let, if you break this down for a second. Irony doesn't exist, only literalism. It's great. It's really fun. These people are fun parties. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, okay. Everybody's well, so, always waiting for human resources to show up. They're such a fun bunch. Uh, well, the first thing that you, have to, that you have to ask yourself if this is your inclination is, why have you, the listener, given up your sovereignty as an individual with control over yourself? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, you heard a thing and you didn't like it. Other people heard the thing and didn't mind it. So whether or not you're right and they're wrong or, or if there is even such a scale to judge that, you have to acknowledge that there are multiple interpretations of the same thing. So where do you think yours, your response originates from? Like, you, you, you See, are, this, this is the non-systemic emotional people I was talking about, John, and they're rewarded by their, their lot for being emotional. They're like, like freak out. It's, it's a sign of moral purity. And, and so they, they do that. And like, there's, there's a great John Cleese quote where uh, Cleese, who's like, you know, anti-Trump British Lib Dem, but he's not super PC. Uh, he said, if, if you can't control your emotions, you have to control other people's speech. And I was like, that sounds about right to me. If, if you are, if you do not have the, the, a hint of stoicism controlling your own reactions to things, then you have to be controlling everybody else because that's the only method by which you're able to keep from being in some sort of awful state. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm working on this film uh, about the way kids are being raised and 
the uh, you know it's drawing a lot on Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff's book, mm -hmm. The Coddling of the American Mind. Right. And as part of it, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be an adult. And and, and it's and one of the things that I feel like we we we've we are losing rapidly is even a definition of what it means to be an adult. You know, we have this hashtag adulting. But it's like, I'm doing my own laundry, hashtag adulting. It's like, no, no, that's not being an adult. <laughs> doing your own laundry is an incredibly low bar for being an adult. Having control of your emotions is one of the things that it comes with being an adult. Like, like, and and I, I find it interesting to think about the flip side. So what, what when someone doesn't have control over their emotions can't regulate their response to events what do we call that person and let's focus on say a 12 year old not in a not an actual like 35 year old sitting in a comedy club right they, we call them a bit they're acting like a baby right mm -hmm. like babies toddlers pre-pubescent and pre-age of reason kids they just have no filter they just they're like uh stimulus response machines i i i have gas i'm gonna scream i'm right. hungry they're, i'm gonna they're, scream. they're they're reacting instead of responding it's fine to respond but react i don't want to react to stuff i don't i don't i don't want to have i don't want to be at everybody else's mercy and beck and call i would like to be able to mentally chart the course that I have. If somebody says something offensive, it might well necessitate me going, hey, that is truly out of line. You, you said, or, or, you know, you're, you know, it's, it's not that you can't call people out, but I would like to be able to do it, you know, w without my mouth going dry and like, uh, uh, you know, like, like losing bowel control. I prefer to be, you know, like, like coherent when I do that. Well, but I mean, don't you think that in a way it's like you almost, and I'm not being charitable here. I'm not, I'm saying, but, but that response that like, I judge something on the basis of, did I respond? If it made me uncomfortable, therefore it was like an assault on me. You're basically being a baby. You're, you're, you're acting like a child. Sure, yeah. Why has that become, like, why do you think it's become a mass movement of acting like babies? Why is acting like a baby as a full grown adult not it quickly becoming something that you, like the rest of the people around you don't feel like it's their place to like roll their eyes at you or tell you, Hey, like cut it out. <laughs> I think I, I don't like, I don't know. I mean, my suspicion is that there's probably sort of innate psychological profiles that lend themselves to that. But the, the other problem is that I think that uh, it's way more fun and way more sexy to be angry than it is to be like the, the like who, who's more fun? The person walking up a hill with their fist in the air, talking about whatever the injustice is, whether it's real or not, right? Is it more fun to be that person or the person in the room going, you know, if we change the orientation of the parking lot, we can add in an additional three slots. Like that person's not fun. Nobody wants to be that person. <laughs> like uh, like when, I, when I was in college, um, I, I went to, I went to a, a protest about the, the Rwandan genocide and I like it was, I'm very against the Rwanda genocide, by the way. I want to preface this. I'm super anti, uh -oh, here we go. anti Rwanda genocide. But it, but I was genuinely like it was the first protest I'd ever been to, and I was kind of I was confused by it because I would talk to people and be like, who, like what what is our goal here? Who are we protesting? Are we protesting the American government governments in action? Are we trying to are we trying to send a signal to the Rwandan government? Like what is the what is the object of this protest? What is the goal? And like. And like the impression I got was there was like, I just really like protesting. Like, I just really enjoy, like, I just enjoy getting mad about stuff that's unjust. And, and, and it's like, again, the, their, their, their uh, analysis was spot on. The, 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 the genocide's bad. But the impression I got was that if that hadn't existed, they would have found something else uh, to, to occupy that impulse. Well, I went to Penn State and we would, the, riots would occur as celebration for winning a football game. <laughs> So there's something <laughs> it's like, oh, the, we won, we won against Ohio. Let's burn cars in the streets. Right. Yeah. So there's something, uh, there's definitely something about 
being part of like a mass. Well, and I, to go back to my religious thesis, I mean, I think that, that protests have become the new religious liturgy. Like, what do you do at a protest? Uh, and again, they could be founded on a correct thing, but you you go there to share values with like-minded people. There's usually, you know, coordinated stuff going on, whether it's a dance or whether it's a song, you know, we're going to sing some song about our values. And when people leave, they're glowing because they've gone to a tent revival. And uh, I, I imagine that's quite addictive too. So you, um, and I know this play by play because I've been with you in periodically through it, but you, uh, you had a way, a way, a stopover in Texas uh, after leaving the pool house at, at, at uh -huh. Casa de Popola um, at the Blaze at, at uh, mm -hmm. Glenn Beck's um, Enterprise. Right. Um, I said, when, when was that? That was like th three years ago? Oh, it was about a, two, I mean, two, I, two and a half. My, my tenure there concluded last June. So that would have okay. been, it would have yeah. been about yeah, yeah, a year and a half ago or so. Yeah. It feels like we are living in a different world already. Like just in the past year. But what was the biggest, what was the most difficult lesson you learned from being in that environment, especially in just in terms of the interactions you had with audience and, hmm. you know, you talked about sort of the, your, your peers and comedy, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about this quite a bit, but as you've, as you reflect back, you know, having survived the transition, yeah. um, what, what do you look back on and, 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 uh, and feel like you learned from that or that, or that was like difficult? I think the the two, well, the th I'm going to say I learned three lessons from that. One, which is more directly targeted at the blaze, and I'll, I'll preface this, I disagree with a good many people at the blaze on a good many things, but I was treated very well while I was there. Uh, and while I was frequently the odd man out, particularly on um, social issues and, uh, and some culture war stuff, uh, at the same time, I like, you know, I, I was always nice. They're always treated, they always treated me very well. So I, I don't want to... Um, bespeak my time there. That said, though, uh, I am now extremely wary to get on anybody else's boat, because um, that was that was something I was very concerned with, and I think did hinder my ability to bring on guests. Like, so um, the, 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 my current show, the, the Political Orphanage, is a weekly program, and, and I, I, you know, produce those episodes a little bit more. When I was doing uh, Something's Off with Andrew Heaton, which was my show at The Blaze, I was doing a daily program. And it was very important to me doing a daily program, having that much content, that we not be an echo chamber and that we not, uh, we, we not be adding to what I saw as systemic problems in media. And so uh, I was emphatic and drove my producer nuts because uh, I would go every week, we're going to have somebody that I disagree with who's conservative and somebody that I disagree with, or I should say, we're going to have a conservative viewpoint and a progressive viewpoint. I might agree with them, I might not. And then I, I will field the wacky independent and or libertarian role and the other two are just gravy. But we, I made it a point. I didn't want any week to go by without having a progressive on the show because I thought it was very important that we, we be providing multiple viewpoints to the audience. It was irritating to my producer because he could have just walked outside and grabbed, you know, like a garden variety conservative at any time. We wouldn't even have to plan. We'd just walk outside and be like, y'all want to talk about Iraq? And they'd come on in. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of a lot of extra work on iron, but it was also it was also tough. Uh, I think, and and you know, this is all supposition on my part, but um, by virtue of being there, I think that there there were people that were assuming I must be a very full throated conservative if I was working at the Blaze, which was not the case. And so I am uh, today much more reticent to tie my wagon to anybody else's wagon. I would rather I would rather people interpret me on my own terms on a much smaller boat than be the odd man out on a bigger boat. Um, so that was something. Um, the, I'll say that the, the lessons I learned about how to do my job um, were very positive. Uh, the, the first one I learned from the blaze that I, I learned directly there, and I'm very, very grateful for this lesson, is that you can actually trust audiences to really walk with you a long time. And you can trust audiences to, uh, to, to not agree with you and to stick around and be interested in it. Um, the thing that they don't respond to is contempt. And one of the things that I, find, I found very rewarding when I was at The Blaze and that I, I find very rewarding right now, I got two emails today that literally said this, 
I, I really disagree with your position on your last episode, but uh, I thought it was very interesting and I, I appreciated how you talked to your guests about it. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who like being challenged. They like seeing other viewpoints and that was true at the blaze. And, uh, and, and the, the thing that they don't respond to is not contrary ideas or different viewpoints. The thing that they don't respond to is being told that they're stupid or evil or bigoted. Weirdly enough, people don't respond to character attacks very well. And I, I found that on my program. So like my program, the, the listeners lean heavily libertarian. That's the predominant political background of people that listen to my show. But the guests that tend to be the most popular are when I bring on charming progressives who have a very different viewpoint, but they clearly, they're clearly friends with me. And they, when, when they discuss conservatives or they discuss libertarians, it's from a position of disagreement rather than a position of contempt. And listeners will write in and be like, I really like that guest, bring him back in because they enjoy that different thing. So that's a big thing I learned. And, and it's, it's been um, really helpful for me and, and extremely comforting as I do my job because it's kind of, it, it is a little bit terrifying to get paid for a living to espouse your opinion, because there's a, a part of your brain that's like, if I, if I apparently, if I if, uh, espouse the wrong opinion, I go live in a van and not a good van, like a Chris Farley style van. And, and so that's you know kind of at the back of my mind when I do this, but I am not I've a good for my audience. Yeah, not, not, Cause there's some good transit vans. Like I could, you know, what with COVID going on and how, Spencer Vrind is in California. The fact that dating doesn't exist anymore. I have no incentive to live in an apartment. I might as well get an RV. Uh, but but I but I found that the I found that the audience uh, I can trust the audience. I've built up a rapport with my audience, and I can trust them that as long as I am being honest and respectful, that I am unlikely to have anybody just pull up. Because uh, like like I I tend to be far more bullish and supportive of social safety net type stuff, which is not the standard libertarian position. And I'm also, you know, kind of center left on gun control. And, and the Second Amendment people really? take that very, very seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, you know what I did was, I, like I had mentioned it a couple of times, listeners on the program um, reached out to me and they went, hey, like, uh, I, like I, I you know, strongly disagree with you on your position on guns. I really wish you would talk to somebody that knew this stuff and, and could discuss it well with you. And several people recommended a guy named Charles Cook, who's a friend of mine from National Review, uh, who's like, he, he was British. Now he's like super Florida. It's amazing. Like he's the, <laughs> this, this, the same trip. He ditched I, the accent. Yeah, you, 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 like, I mean, that's one of the biggest things. If you, you know, Americans will go to England and as quickly as possible, try to adopt the accent. Yeah. But if you're yeah, English and you come to the you, U.S., you, don't try to adopt our, keep why it. Would you? <laughs> no, why, why would you? You because everybody assumes you're like some sort of royal prince character. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, that's so uh, though. Charge, you know, Charlie's wandering around Everglades now, like with you know two guns under his arms. Like yeah. he's he's, he's, a, he's he's a good old boy. Yeah, shooting gators, like wrestling, shooting, eating, all that stuff. And we had, like we had a really good hour long conversation where I told him you know policies that I thought would work well. He told me policies he thought would work well. We explained why we didn't. But like by the end of the episode, like it was. It kind of my audience was like, all right, okay, you like you engage this guy. It was respectful, uh, and like they still disagree with me on all that stuff, but they uh, they kind of feel like you know I, I made a, a good college effort on it. And uh, the the other thing I learned is just um, like I, I learned, uh, John, I learned so much about not creating unnecessary work for yourself because <laughs> if you're doing when you're doing a daily show, like I was doing. Um, because like, you know, I, I am a comedian and, and in my, like, I've, I've slowly learned that people listen to the political orphanage, uh, my podcast, they listen to that primarily because they like a, they, they like a non-histrionic, non-combative state to encounter ideas. That's, that's what I'm selling. I'm, I'm the Mr. Rogers of free enterprise. That's what I am. That's what people like. And it took me a long time <laughs> to understand that. I assume people were coming because I'm a comedian. And so I needed to just crank out comedy. And so I was doing, you know, a, a fake commercial ad every day. Oh, yeah. And I was doing comedy it's sketches. A lot of a lot of production. Day. Yeah, and it was just like, and and that, I guess that's an insane amount of comedy to be cranking out on a daily basis. That is not like usually that kind of thing involves like a team of writers that I was doing. Uh, and I it, I learned kind of the limits of my uh, my my creative productivity, which are fortunately quite quite broad. Uh, but I also just learned there's just there's things you can just not don't don't take them on, <laughs> and you could there, there, there's ways to streamline stuff, and there's ways to uh, um, create a good product without having to, to just, you know, run yourself to death, which unfortunately I'm now doing because I keep adding projects for free. Uh, but, but I at least learned the lesson before I got into it. 
Well, I think we also share the, uh, the monkey brain problem, the constantly coming up with, oh, I should try to do that. And I should yeah. try to do that. And uh, yeah, it's, um, there's a little bit of ADD going on for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, uh, you have another podcast. Yes. Alienating the audience, my sci-fi <laughs> podcast. That's, that's the baby. That's what I hope becomes the main source of income someday. That's the fun <laughs> one for me. So, so what's the, uh, give me the, give me the rundown on it. What's the, yeah, so, okay. I, I am, I, I am really interested in how people think, like I'm really interested in that. And I'm really interested in getting into the deeper meanings of things. So I, I enjoy taking science fiction and going, let's, let's look at Dune and let's talk about the economics of Dune, which by, by the way, I tip of the hat to John Popola. That's probably a direct relationship from doing econ pop <laughs> with you of knowing yes. that I could, I could analyze things economically, but like, uh, like, like, like we did an episode recently on Battlestar Galactica, where we talk about like, you know, what, what are the ideas Battlestar Galactica is playing around with? It's playing around with nine 11. It's playing around with religious extremism. It's playing around with, uh, you know, the occupation of Iraq, because that basically happens in, in Battlestar. And it's playing around with, you know, sort of pluralism versus mon or polytheism versus monotheism. And I'm, I'm really interested in those, those concepts. So I do a lot of programs like that. Um, I do a lot of shows, uh, a little bit rarer because they take a lot more prep time. But I, I have found that uh, in, in, in the same way that um, it's pretty squirrely to get guests on a political podcast right now, it takes a lot of bending around to convince people that you're not a communist or a fascist or whatever. People are, are pretty hesitant at the moment. Right, right. Sci-fi is the exact opposite of that. Like I'm friends Please with Please talk to me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm friends with like half the professors at Duke now because I would, I would email somebody and be like, hey, I heard you're really into Star Trek. And they're like, yeah, I wrote a book on the genetics of Star Trek. And I'm like, you want to come on my show? Yeah. And so I'll, I'll bring out a lot of the time I'll bring on scientists. I'm like, like explain something to me through science fiction. Cause I don't know what I'm talking. I don't know science, but I can talk about sci-fi and let's talk about that. And then, and then there's just a fair amount of like just super nerdy stuff. Do you, do you know Tim Sandifer by chance? I, I imagine you guys know each other. I know. So I know. This I know of Tim Sandifer. Sandifer. Yeah. So, so like the, the next episode on alienating the audience is just me and Tim Sander for fighting about Star Trek, the undiscovered country. It's just us arguing uh, I, I take the position that The Undiscovered Country is uh, a brilliant film uh, and, and well-deserved of all accolades, whereas Tim is a sociopath and uh, <laughs> takes, the, takes the opposite position. He's uh, like, no, no, no. Yeah, I do Star a lot Trek of that. And then, and then I, then I, then I, then I, yeah, and then, and then I also do, um, I do uh, comedy on that one. I do what we call vagabonding, where my friend uh, Nick and I, uh, we, we, we do like a 15 to 20 minute comedy sketch predicate on the idea that we are comedians who are visiting other planets and we're discussing what's happening there. We're going on adventures. So like we go to Vulcan. I hate Vulcan. I don't like heat. I don't like sweating. All they want to do is talk about math. They're super snobby. Uh, Nick really <laughs> likes it. He thinks that they're fun. We, we go to the, the replica. We go to the Fimbot homeworld and he's married. So it doesn't do anything for him, but I'm thrilled because it's a bunch of super logical hot people. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so we so it's fun. It's a fun show. Okay. So Star Trek versus Star Wars. Your preference? Okay. Uh, I think it's, I, I, I don't think you even have to draw the, the parallel because I see them as occupying two very different slots. Star Trek is science fiction. Star Wars is fantasy in space. Like if you called, if, you, if, if George Lucas had called Star Wars yeah. rocket wizards, it would make as much sense. Yeah. And, and I like them both. Uh, but, but I think they're very different. And, and Star Wars is, you know, epic movies, uh, exclusively up until the Mandalorian came out and like a brief thing involving Ewoks in the in the 90s, uh, whereas Star Trek is this massive, 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 massive uh, procedural television program. Uh, I'd, I'd say my heart rests with Star Trek, but I like both. I can swing both ways. So I, um, it's it's funny because my heart is also firmly with Star Trek. And did and did you uh, did you see did you watch Picard? Yes, I did. Yeah. I so before I we watched Picard with uh with my son who hasn't had the opportunity to see all of the Star Trek I have seen we went systematically through every Borg everything where the Borg has ever oh, been Oh nice right So okay. the fir, you know like the there's two it's easy to forget there was the first encounter with the Borg happens mm -hmm. I think in season 1 Yeah Q introduces the crew Yeah with Q Yeah, yeah. um it's like the second episode where Q appears, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the uh, and then the Locutus 
two-parter, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, First Contact. Nice, which was a great film. Which was great, yeah. And then we watched Picard. It was like, so then he had the full... Which good. So yeah, the he, whole he understands the emotional weight behind this. Yeah, yeah you just, uh, you, you know, and you got to spend some time with Picard and Data to appreciate that relationship. And yeah, you I, didn't um, make him watch Nemesis, though. You just told him Data's <laughs> dead. <laughs> I think that's the right move. <laughs> I, you know, that watching Picard made me want to revisit um, Nemesis. Maybe, but, maybe it would be better this time. I saw it once in film or in theater, and I've never felt the compulsion to watch it again. I just, I don't like that one. Yeah, for a variety of reasons. Insurrection is pretty low on the totem pole for me. It was like an episode yeah. that didn't that yep. barely belonged on the on the big screen. I a hundred percent I feel like insurrection feels like a mid season snoozer episode. <laughs> it's like okay to fold laundry to. It's not horrible, but you don't really need to pay that much attention to it. It was yeah, right. that was an odd one. They could have done far better stuff yeah 100%. it's the it, it, one of the best things to happen to television is abandoning the 21 to 24 episode season mm -hmm. the, I, there is no show concept that can have a fulfilling arc in 21 20 it, it, 18 so, hours it just it, it, it's so cool that we now like like television's so much better than I when I was a kid. Like I, I like, like you know, a lot of the time we get into this habit of of, of fetishizing our childhood and how much better it was at all that. Like, I guess I'm glad I didn't have social media as a kid. But I gotta say, TV's way better, and I have it on demand now, which is great because I live in a bubble. Uh, so like, it's <laughs> nice that I've got that. And like. I like I love Star Trek. I like I when I discuss Star Trek, I am talking about my religion. Like I like any anybody I talk about, I'm talking the same way I would have discussed a bishop when I like when I was a like an, an active member of the East Orthodox Church. So like I like but that said though, <laughs> like 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 the original series, wonderful though it is, and it's I argue it's basically the Twilight Zone in space. People misinterpret what yes. it is. A series of thought experiments with a recurring spaceship and crew. But the same thing though it 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 ends every every time like like you know the the or tng same thing it's procedural so tng they they find a new planet and go oh this is an interesting planet down on the surface the individuals all live in 18th century french conditions i oh, love well. i love the amount of use a paramount Lots yes. <laughs> set episodes yeah. of the next generation or like how, like now we're in 1920s uh mobster it's like yeah. it's like and it's like, is this on the holodeck? No, this is a planet that is in yep. quant uh, alternate yes, reality. Same, same with T1. I, get, I get the distinct impression that, that every month on, T, on, on the original series, they'd go, hey, Gene, uh, if you could set this in a Western, it would really do us a solid. But, they, you know, they go down to the planet and then somebody, the, a red shirt gets shot. And then they go, well, we all learned an interesting lesson. Let's be back to the Enterprise, engage, and they move on and it resets. And, and it's, it's kind of rare to have any type of, of There's large- There's a trail of art. ensign. There's a trail of ensign bodies. <laughs> you know what? Throughout trail the galaxy. Of ensigns, trail of ensigns would be a great series in Star Trek. I would absolutely watch I Trail think, of Ensigns. I think they have, I, I saw, I just watched, well, I watched most of a trailer for a new animated Star Trek show. Below Decks? On, below Decks. And Lisa yeah. was like, stop watching this. They're giving away all the best joke moments. And we is, stopped. Is it going to be a comedy? It's a, it's a comedy. Wow, OK. And, I, look, uh, I look forward to seeing how that pans out. I hope Trail of well. Ensigns, I think, actually is a better title. <laughs> yeah, Trail of Ensigns would be great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful that it's all like, um, that we, we've got into these procedurals like uh, um, I, I mean, Breaking Bad's obviously not Star Trek, but I think Breaking Bad might have been the first series that I watched that had that long, long character arc. Uh, and it was great where, you know, you, you really get to build that up as opposed to like even a film where like films now feel kind of unfulfilling to me a lot of the time. Cause it's like, how long have they got to build up the character? Two hours? <sighs> barely, you know, barely get right. to know him over two hours. I need a solid 22 hours to really, you know, dig in. The, uh, I think we I think we've honed in on the two um entertainment platforms that are the best and I think they go clearly in this order. Video games number 1, okay? TV series number 2. 
cool. films, books, everything else falls below video games. Yeah. And, uh, and then, t- and then great TV series, I, I, it's I scripted do, or unscripted. I do podcasts for a living, and I will acknowledge that they exist for while you're driving to work or doing your dishes. <laughs> they're, they, they're, it's like, I love Heaton, and anytime I've got nothing to do, I listen right. to him. <laughs> no, it's not just that. Anytime that I've got nothing to do, but I have to use my hands for something, then I'm going to do it. I've got, I've got right, to right. clean those dishes. Now, now's a good Heaton time. I've, I've got, got something to do that won't use enough of my brain that I can't fill some of it with yeah. Heaton or Popola it's, or Rogan. Or, right. <laughs> we, we belong nowhere near with, Rogan, with, with the games though hold on so walk me through this because i um i only play two video games at present i play civilization five i think it's civilization five and i play age of empires two both of which are from like respectively 1998 and 2002 like i <laughs> right. i know i have when i when i was when i was down in austin last time i was staying with with brian brushwood who has an ocular or no, he doesn't have an oculus quest he's got a, a htc vibe, vibe yeah yeah, he's got a vibe, and that was mind blowing. Like I gotta say, that was crazy cool. And if I had one of those, I would play it a lot. What day? What games are you playing that you would rank above TV? Well, I, I, um, I personally really like the story driven uh, sort of adventure games that like Naughty Dog makes. So um, the Uncharted Four was awesome. God of War. I'm playing the. We, Last of would Us this Part be like, Two. Like a, These are PlayStation like, like, Four. They used to have like Star Wars: The Old Republic, that kind of thing. No, Again, they're all like of my all my references are rooted in the '90s for some reason. <laughs> right, right. right. You're yeah. like, is it anything like Doom? No. Well, these are. It's like. I mean, they're. I don't even know how to. I think I have to reconstruct an entire knowledge base for you to for me to explain this these games to you. If you're if, if your starting point is. I mean, I'm open. I think COVID's going to keep going for a while, <laughs> right. so it's not a bad Get idea for me a to invest in something. Yeah. Get yourself a PlayStation. Uh, well, you could say it's like you've seen the lo- like Tomb Raider, right? No, Ever played I Tomb know Raider? of Tomb Raider, but I haven't played it or seen it. Well, you are a character going going through a world. Sometimes you're shooting people. Sometimes right, yeah. you're gathering resources. Sometimes you're trying to find your way out of a place. Mm-hmm. But but they've achieved a kind of high art now because, um, you know, so for example, The Last of Us, which is like you are an immune girl in a post-apocalyptic zombie story. Oh, Cool. And I love, in, I, like, I love watching and reading about zombie apocalypse so I could be in one. Oh, so you can be an immune girl trying to survive a path, a, 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 like a, a basically on foot path across the country to a place where they're de- trying to develop a cure. Is this PC or is this, is this a uh, 3D? This, this is PlayStation. Okay. Yeah, this is PlayStation, but I love those uh, kind of games. Cause they're like, they're like a movie that you play. And, and now it's, it, it, now you've got this benefit of the actual in-game graphics are so good that you never cut away to like something that was, that's clearly way better than the game. So the, in the old days, the, you know, your, the days that you remember of video games, you'd be playing something that looks really pixelated and kind yeah. of somewhat terrible. And then you'd arrive and there'd be like a little cut scene. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah, would yeah. be like fully World animated like amazing. That. And it's like, oh, I wish the game looked like that. Well, now the games look like, all look like that. And so it's Got, totally yeah, seamless. Yeah, because like, yeah, when, I, when I was a kid, I played a ton of Warcraft 2. And that was like that. Like you were playing with little pixelated figures. And then there'd be like this cool like dot yeah. MPEG clip that you'd watch. And now right, we're, that was we're like rendered by Industrial Light and Magic. And right, then yeah. the rest of the game looks like, you know, the the like 3d chess from star wars well plus like like with like the, the the 3d stuff i am blown away by how crazy good that is and like and i like and i'm looking at it like we, we're with, with 3d technology uh like like in terms of just generally consumer available oculus quest oculus rift kind of stuff we're about with that where we were when electricity came out at the point where if you bought a washing machine you'd unscrew your light bulb and screw your washing machine into the ceiling because it hadn't occurred to anybody to make a plug yet. And that's about where we are. And I'm like, that, like, that is going to be crazy cool. And the, the, the technology that's around the corner there where, like at the moment, my understanding, at least with the vibe, you know, you sort of cart, cordon off part of your, your home and you're like, I've got this designated square I can walk around in, but they're working on technology that would like chart your entire house and build it into the game 
or alternately figure out how to steer you in such a way that you don't run into stuff. And I'm like, at some point, we're going to get have a, a point where you can just like, you know, sort of live in Game of Thrones for like a month. Yeah, and, it's uh, it's yeah. it's getting to the it's getting more and more holodeck like by the day just across the streams. But mm. so so that so but I mean the thing about game the thing to me about game video games that's just so incredible is that they're now there they there are so many genres that are so immersive. I mean my you know my son doesn't even feel like there's been an impact on his life by the pandemic because most of his friends he engages through a discord channel which is the like the, um, the game it's like a gaming chat service that right, basically yeah. looks like a ripoff of slack no um, I, I like it. I, we, we use this there's i've got a discord thing for my my podcasts and it's it's like it's like it reminds me of like a 90s aol chat room right uh, it, except that it's only people <laughs> that want to be there it's not just random strangers that are going out looking to yell at people and um yeah so then he's so there's so many different genres but they're so engrossed you know, I talk to him about this all the time. It's a, you spend, you know, you spend $15 to go to a movie and that's two hours of entertainment. You spend say 60 bucks and you get hundreds of hours of entertainment out of a game. So to me, gaming has, has achieved the number one slot for entertainment. Nice. And I, and I wonder, I, it makes me wonder, is there any opportunity with, um, to make games that have I have sort of philosophical ideas in them that without wrecking them and turning them to, into didactic garbage. Yeah, that's tough. I gotta say, like, like one of the jokes I've got in my stand-up routine, John, is I I I I, I make fun of conservatives and I make fun of progressives. Then I go, uh, anybody ever tried to play Sim City as a libertarian? That's pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> No, I like like uh, I'm gonna start my my city here, and I'm done. I'm gonna let the free market <laughs> handle this one. Uh, like, and I I find that there's generally like I, I it's kind of hard to get around it. Like 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 I love playing Civilization Five, as I mentioned earlier, and you can pick the different you know civic things. You can pick your economic system and your your uh your your political system, and you can see the biases of Sid Meier's and his crew in there. And that free market's fourth out of five of the economic systems. The fifth system is of course environmentalism which as we all know is an economic system the environment the environmentalism uh and yes. uh, but it's you know and, and, and like and it's also like and like like aside from that like that whole game you're you're directing all of the production of all of your cities you know i want you to focus on warriors i want you to focus on aqueducts and it's it's fun it's very engaging but like i'm not sure how you would do it without having that like kind of statist bent to it particularly for well strategy. it is interesting because um the massively online multiplayer games have whole ecosystems because the, because you're you're not you're not a single central planner constructing civilization or a city mm. you're one agent operating in this environment and i forget which game there's actually been a game that has experienced recessions wow because maybe, maybe, of, maybe World of Warcraft, because I, well, I haven't played it. I know that there like, was, was a whole economy there. And then there was another one like League of Legends, I think. I that think it might have been thing. EVE Online. Hmm. Um, I, let me, let me, I'm going to Google it right now. Let's see, EVE Online Recession. I do think you could, you could see, you could definitely teach or, or intuit the benefit of um, socializing and alliances and grouping that that seems like a thing that could happen i was talking to a couple of my friends some, a couple of days ago where uh they uh the husband was playing some some game that's some sort of combat strategy game and and then his wife got involved and his wife would just email all of the other top top combat people and be like we're forming a clan like come like you know and then all of a sudden these guys are all in the top 20 and like my, <laughs> my friend was like oh wow like you know being part of a group and and cooperating was very helpful and like like i could see that being a thing yeah it's a uh, i think it was yeah the eve online real estate crisis yeah so there so there actually is a there is bottom up organization games. It just uh, you ha you've been trapped in SimCity CD ROMs from two thousand and three, so you haven't. <laughs> uh, what's well, the wait, like? Would would would, mine, would Minecraft be that way? Because I feel like yeah. Minecraft you're assembling your universe, aren't you? I haven't played it, but it strikes me as 
like you're, you're making stuff as opposed to solving stuff. You know, it's funny. I, I'm such a Lego. I mean, I have like, here's the most recent Lego build of mine, which is the, is that, it looks like the Land did. Rover. Yeah. It's yeah, the yeah, Land yeah, Rover. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, every so often I'll be like, I gotta, buy, I gotta buy a Lego set and it will come into my inbox from my Lego VIP account. Like, look at this cool new Land Rover. I will have, I will. Well, I remember at your, your old house, the, you had like a designated Lego room. And I don't remember if that was like nominally Mateo's playroom, but it was very clearly no, the no, John that Lego was my room. room. That was it was, my, yeah, I was about to say like, it was clear what the focus of that room was. It was Legos. <laughs> um, so uh, I, it's been partly heartbreaking that, uh, Mateo, as he got older, sort of lost interest in Legos. Hmm. But it's made up for by how much, he sp how much he does in Minecraft. And he's even learned this, there's like a scripting language in Minecraft. So wow. he's built like complicated sort of programmatic things. He's like, oh, I figured out how to make myself look like an animal. And it was like, well, how did you do that? And he's like, well, I wrote this script that reproduces my movements and places the animal in the position where I would be and makes me invisible. It's like, he like hacked it. Whoa. Um, so Minecraft is amazing. I, I tapped out at WordPress. That was the highest level of <laughs> yeah. HTML editing I ever arrived at. Whoa. Yeah, scripting command blocks in Minecraft is the next level, is the next level of, uh, you know, I've got some time on my hands. What should I do next? Um, speaking of what we should do next, where, where, what's the next for, for your, uh, your, your independent podcast empire endeavors, Andrew? Hmm. Well, I've got a couple of things. There's um, outside of the podcasting, I've got a couple, of, uh, a couple of things that I can't talk about at the moment, but some possible TV shows that are, are being discussed and we're figuring that out in terms of funding location and if it exists during the post-COVID empire. But that might, that might be a thing that happens in 2020. Uh, and that would be fun if that were the case. In terms of the podcasting, um, I uh, w alienating the audience. I have a harder time growing that one, just because polit politically, I, I, I is a quick secret for anybody listening that's doing their own podcast, which I assume everybody in America is now. Uh, you 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 tend to grow your listenership by going on other podcasts, but with sci-fi podcasts, it's kind of hard to do it uh, because it, it tends to be an in, an inbuilt crowd of people. Uh, that said, though, it's getting like the 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 sci-fi one. I'm getting really cool guests like i like there's a, a book i love called uh uh the girl with all the gifts which is a, a zombie book and a really really good zombie book and we did a whole episode reviewing it and i just tweeted at the author and was like hey we reviewed your book and then like now like he and i are dialoguing and he's like can i come on and i was like yeah sure like i've, I've had some like i've had some good guests on that that's and awesome like, yeah and I've, I've got a couple that are like pretty well known that are sort of lined up and uh with with the political one um I don't know how that's going to go for 2020. I'll say this, John. Uh, when, when, when is this going to drop, by the way? Uh, Jesse, where, where do you, um, when do you think? I'm not sure. I, I leave this to our producer, <laughs> our extraordinaire Jesse Bennett, to, to, to determine. August, level. great. Okay, good. So, so, John, by the time this drops, I will have already announced my candidacy to run for vice president of the United States. <laughs> I'm rebooting the Whig party. And uh, I'm not running for president. I'm, I'm the highest person on the ticket. We're only running a VP candidate. And uh, I'm already looking into getting on the ballot in Louisiana. So I think it's a very good chance that I'll be running for vice president, but only in Louisiana. And so I'll be able to dedicate some of the podcast to that. I'll keep doing uh, uh, cool thought experts or uh, thought leaders and experts that, that I'm bringing on like I usually do. And I'll keep doing the, um, the Friday release valve, which is where I kick around funny headlines with comedians just for my own, my own amusement, that of the listeners. And I think that one will be interesting because the longer I do that, the more comedians I'm meeting remotely that I'm able to bring on and kind of cycle through some interesting comedic guests. So uh, at, least, at least with the, the political podcasting empire, I, I think some pretty cool authors and, and possibly some big names that have agreed to come on but haven't, haven't committed to uh, scheduling yet combined with some interesting comedians. So that ought to be fun. Plus I might become vice president, who knows? It's it or vi vice president of Louisiana. Yeah, that's, that's, I, that's... If I, I think that's how it works, right? If, they, <laughs> if I if I if I win, I just become vice president of Louisiana. Yeah, I'll I'll do it. I'll do it. New Orleans is fun. I'll move there. <laughs> um, how are you in California to stay? 
I don't know. I kind of doubt it, John. I, uh, I moved to Los Angeles against your advice as well as everybody <laughs> else's at Austin. Uh, and I, I moved out there in January of 2020 and I got, I, I got a lease on an apartment, the most expensive lease of my life, in mid-February of 2020. And I moved to Los Angeles for the networking. I went out there going, I'm going to move to a new city in a desert, a biome I hate, in order to further my career by networking. And yes, it's expensive, but, it, but I'll, I'll, you know, the connections I'm going to make are going to turn into some interesting. And then lockdown happened. I had one month of having an apartment in LA before lockdown happened. And uh, so at present, I am looking at that going, all right, do I, do I keep paying this exorbitant rent, hoping that the situation resumes enough normalcy that, that I can, you know, go, go to comedy shows and start networking. And I, my, I, I could be wrong about this, but I'm kind of looking at this going, I suspect that the next year and a half are not going to be good for out, industry outsiders. I think, that the, I think that the entertainment complex will spin up in reasonably short order in LA, but I think it's going to be people that producers already know and, and the directors already know, actors people already know. And so, uh, uh, I, I am looking at possibly getting out of that, and and I'd, I'd either you know move to Portland or Tulsa or Austin or someplace. Somebody was cheaper rent, because right now everything I'm doing is remote anyway. So I might as well quit paying LA prices and California well, taxes. Uh, uh, by the time uh, that that moment happens, we might have a bigger, more comfortable guest house for you to. <laughs> to come to yes. we'll just do this as a cycle i'll just I'll come back and live in your, your pool house and then and then i'll uh, i'll go off to some other state or some other job and then in the meantime you'll upgrade like a hermit crab you'll you'll move into a bigger one and then i'll i'll you know crash down again in austin but i'll I'm like oh this is cool now john's pool house is like four four thousand square feet uh and uh, oh, yeah uh, it's great and then eventually uh, I'll just become your butler, which I'm fine with, by the way. I, I'm, I'm okay being the Popola butler. That's it's a, that, it's that's a good, that's good the business. solution to the to the concerns of the of the um the the automation will take our jobs. It's like no, we're gonna have it's gonna be the new um uh what was the what was the British show that everybody loves um uh, Downton uh, Abbey yeah, Downton yeah. Abbey will it'll be like a neo Victorian Downton Abbey life. <laughs> somehow I, I somehow i think that's probably not an appealing pitch to people but for most people <laughs> on on my hand though is is a, is a dude that basically wakes up at a gilbert and sullivan operetta every day that has a lot of appeal to me i'm like i i know how i fit into that universe so i, I went to um i went to disneyland uh right when i got to la and my it was my friends and i were walking around and at the end of it they were like heaton you fit you fit in in literally every time period we visited, except the one we live in, <laughs> like like when we went to Main Street USA, and like you know, there's these guys in you know barbershop quartets and seersucker suits and straw hats. They're like Heaton could run for mayor of that place, and it would make total sense. And we got Tomorrowland. And they're like, yeah, Heaton could be in a lab coat living on a rocket. And then we got to the parking lot. They were like, sorry, buddy, <laughs> you're back <laughs> to being a weirdo in the year 2020. So yeah, then, I, I, yeah, the, the, downtown Abbey didn't bother me. Uh, well, the, when when we when we recreate that uh, that the Halcyon, Vic, uh, is it Victorian or Edwardian? I don't know. I think I think, I, I think Victorian's I'm going back a little probably far. funnier. I feel like the Victorians were stuffier. I don't know about yeah, the Edwardians. Yeah, no, it's an, it's much. the Edwardian. It's like the pre-war, you know, right. the sort of uh, waning pre-war uh, era, of, um, which is also in my mind probably the the highlight of uh, of of male fashion. I think like. The day we got rid of powdered wigs, but we were still wearing ridiculous like velvet ensembles walking around with canes, like that was the <laughs> that was apotheosis, it. the apogee of male fashion. So yeah, like like bring it on. Yeah, now that 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 can be recreated for us yeah. in Austin, Texas, in a world even even in even if COVID lasts forever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. I uh. As we look ahead to the election, as a as a political podcaster, what are you expecting? How are you how are you expecting to navigate our um, battle of the senile? We just oh oh between Trump and Biden. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I am not 
so the, the upshot of the downside to where I'm at is I, I am very um, upfront about I'm not, I'm not yay team, boo team about the Democrats and the Republicans. I'll say I prefer Biden over Trump. That's not a hard one for me. I, I prefer that, that Biden beats him. So like that's, that's where I'm at. Um, I suspect, my suspicion is that it's going to get uh, pretty nasty as we get closer. Like I, yeah. like I think that- I think that's uh, a bet that nobody's going to go on the yeah, other side. Yeah, of. The, the, yeah. and, and, and the, the sad thing about that is that I think that um, for people that aren't, that aren't pluralistic in their thinking, that are more emotional, less systemic, uh, and and um, you know more more um, um, uh, conformist in their viewpoints. Everybody's got to conform. Everybody's got to have compliance. I think for them the the zone of acceptable deviance is elastic because it's not based on an objective standard. It's based on the emotional state. So the more stress they get. The, the more I'm going to find myself suddenly on the outside of that, which is sad. Uh, and, and I uh, like that happened a little bit in 2016, where it was like, like, like now, like I'm more moderate than I was in 2016. Like I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a lot less uh, stringent than I was, but, it, but that'll probably happen. Um, yeah, I think it'll get nasty. I'm really hoping that that when when like I, I I hope Biden wins for multiple reasons, but I but I think like for one thing, I think a lot of my friends would calm down if Biden won, like because <laughs> that, like, it's been four, four years of like four years of kind of probationary status of like all right, you're okay, well we're keeping our eye on you, and I like I would love to just go back to like basically the Democrats being the. Uh, the gracious winners, as opposed to the doomsday prophecies, they're more fun as gracious winners. It is a um... that, by the way, the, John, for people listening, John just communicated telepathically that I am the Vichy regime. Like he looked at the camera <laughs> with a lot of side eye, and just like like just projected that. Like well, when John's hand subconsciously reached for like a revolver and a flag. <laughs> Oh, I think I think that it, I think that the next bubble to be burst is the belief that we're going to go back to a new political to a political normal. You know, I think that there's I think one of the one of the things that people haven't grappled with is that Trump is a symptom of his time more than yeah. a kind of odd, how do we get this wacky reality star, multi-bankruptcy, multi-porn Epstein yeah. friend as president? Once he's out, it'll be back to like bland man times. I, yeah, I, we'll, I think we'll... that's a misread of the, I think that's a misread of what's going on. I, I think we're in, I think we're in a, a much like longer run turmoil that is, yeah. I mean, even the fact that we I went mean, from Barack Obama to Donald Trump in and of itself is an insane zigzag. Right. But this stuff's happening all over the world. This crazy, it's like nobody, here's, here's my, my, I, I, I've held this belief for a while, and I think it's uh, it's being sort of echoed back to me in this 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 book I'm reading. That I think what we are suffering from is expecting way too much out of politics. Just people expect so yeah. much out of it, and it's gotten as it's infected more of our life. Um, you're expecting more of your life to be fulfilled by it, and it's it's always going to let you down. It's that terrible, yeah. terrible lover that will not, that will seduce you. And then, you know, walk out in the night and steal your laptop, <laughs> you know, or whatever. I, I, think, I think even at its best, even if we're taking like a very like rosy eyed view of Norwegian, you know, social democracy, the government can protect you and it can give you stuff give you food stamps, it can give you benefits, it can't hug you, it can't love you. And I think that that's a very big part of the problem we have right now. I think in the 20th century, we got in a, we, we, we as, a, as a society, as, as Western civilization, we got into a mindset of fetishizing the state and markets to solve everything. 
that every, every solution either is solved by the government or solved by an economic transaction. And a lot of the time, the problems that we have aren't for lack of security or material comfort, it's for lack of people and lack of community. And that you, it's the relationships that people I think are desperate for. My, my read on the situation is I think that, um, you know, we're, we're a inherently very, in, in a good sense, tribalistic or groupish civilization that gets perverted a lot of the time, but we, we're a communal species. We live in relationships. We yeah. have strong bonds with each other. And we, we you know, for 200,000 years of human history, when we were hunter gatherers, we were on a permanent camping trip with 60 of our closest friends. Like that feeling you get when you go to a wedding and you're like, oh, Uncle Toby. And like, that was, that's normal. That's what, that's what the day-to-day -day human experience is de we're, we're designed for. And what we've done in our civilization is we've gone, you know what? I'm going to live in a box by myself with a cat. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> we're all living in these boxes by ourselves and we're going crazy. Everybody's lonely. Everybody's sad. Everybody's depressed. And my, my read on the situation politically is I think that that incredible relational paucity and breakdown of, of civic society and civic community of I'm in the, I'm in the lions club. And I'm also, I go to first Baptist church and I, you know, I'm in a book club and all that stuff is that atrophies and we stay home and watch Netflix by ourselves. People still have that yearning. And so politics comes around and it goes, Hey, do you want meaning in your life? We're going to give you meaning in your life. We've got a reason for you to get up in the morning is to defeat the bad guy. Do you want a group of people that's part of your community? Terrific. Join our community. And I, I think that, that politics has become this horrible catch-all for these sad, desperate, lonely people that should be finding fulfillment in healthier ways. And as a result, it's making politics this massive Manichaean battle between good and evil for people, whereas it ought to be really a kind of procedural engineering equation. I think you're I think you're onto something very true there. I think it's um I think that everyone the 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 desire for meaning, the search for meaning is the universal human sort of search. Yeah. And a lot of the things that brought people meaning like community and 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 faith have waned and nothing close has sort of filled that gap and uh it's not easy it's not obvious how we write the ship you know you know that i'm a i'm um a rational optimist yeah. <laughs> it's it's it, this has been maybe one of the most trying it's a hard time to be a rational optimist and it's yeah. like I, I'm constantly in search of reasons to 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 be it, and I think uh, I think um, you know you just have to put some amount of faith in like ingenuity that when 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 there's something that people want that badly, um, they're gonna find a way to provide it one way or another. It's like the question is 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 the way we provide it gonna be this sort of psych psych psychological quirk misapplication like believing government can be your mom mm. or believing race your race can find can 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 engender all the meaning you need for yourself uh in, in whatever c capacity like whatever kind of it's never gone off the rails before yes <laughs> yeah yeah racial sectarianism as yeah. a source of your identity has never never gone yeah, yeah. Never been bad. Never I, I think it's I think it's Dickensian. It, it is the worst of times and the best of times. It's, it's the best of times in that, um, you know, like like being a rational optimist. You know all the stats, right? Like eighty percent of global poverty has been reduced over the last ten years, which is mind blowing. We knocked out polio. Uh, we we defeated disco. All the stuff, you know. Like it's just like we we're so far ahead of the game. It's great. Like 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 people. We we've never lived any more. A materially abundant period of human history, and we, we tend to scoff at that in America because we have it so good. But like, oh, we don't we don't believe it. If you ask a, any random group of of a hundred people, seventy five of them, seventy five to eighty of them will say things are worse than they've ever been. Right. That's in and it, that's and in December like, twenty nineteen. Forget pandemic. Right. Yeah, and it, it's sure. yeah. And, and like and it's. I mean, if you, if you ever go to a place with actually poverty stricken people, they 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 are wanting more material. Like they're not. They, they they tend to not be like just super happy in a Disney film because like, you know, they're worried about their babies dying. Like they're like material abundance is a good thing. You can, 
you know, over fetishize it, but like a base level of comforts needed, right? And then on top of that, I think it's an exquisite time to be alive. I think that future archaeologists and historians will look back on the period that we're living through right now, and they will view it as this momentous epic period in human history on par with that of the agricultural revolution and the invention of writing. We're living through the beginning of the information age. We like, we, John, you and I have lived through the transition of being a basically like computers were existent but peripheral to being mainstream to where you and I are talking for free instantaneously on on computers that are you know more impressive than that of NASA like that's a phenomenal thing but I also think that these same historians and these same archaeologists will look back and go as cool as that period was I feel so sorry for those people what a lonely alienated detached time that was they had they'd worked out all the technology but they hadn't caught up with it yet and so they like you know pe people were they, they they'd had their 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 communities be they geographic through neighborhoods or be they uh, 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 religious, that those had atrophied. And so everybody was just lonely and like, oh God, I wouldn't want to live back through that. And I, my hope is that in the same way that we kind of figured out that, that you know, cigarettes are generally bad for you. And like, we, we've, we've, like not everybody's given them up, but they're, they've declined quite a lot. And, uh, and we, you know, COVID aside, we know you're not supposed to eat fast food constantly. We really ought to eat vegetables some. Uh, you know, like there, there are these impulses that uh, we, we pander to that are not good for us, but we do eventually become aware of them and we start coming up with ways to, to deal with them and integrate with that. And I think in much the same way that because our instincts tell us that we're, you know, starvation's around the corner, eat that hamburger as fast as you can, eat right, that right. ice cream, right? I think calories, we have the same, yeah, we have calories the same thing now. <laughs> going on with, with entertainment and social media. And I, I think that we will get to a point like, I, I suspect that you're going to see Twitter die in the next 10 years. Like I, I, I think, cause I find I'm on it because I'm a comedian. Otherwise I would drop that like a rock. It is a cesspool and I, I wish it a quick death. And uh, it's great right. if you're, if you're coordinating flood relief or trying to topple the Iranian regime, but outside of those two things, I, I, I don't want to, I, I just, it's, I just want to use the internet for like Netflix, <laughs> email, dog well, memes and porn those are the only things i want it for i don't want to fight with people well and, twitter uh, is a great place for you as a journalist to discredit yourself that's true you're right so yeah. the there's the, there's a value proposition the, right the, there the, like the i can win a pulitzer the, and be clearly like a liar and it's yeah I, I could i could lose my livelihood now or 40 years from now based on an out of context <laughs> tweet but on the upshot though I might make it into a list of sassy replies to, uh, you know, to some <laughs> yeah. restaurant. Like, oh yeah, I, um, but but I, I think like I think people are going to do that. Like I um like I, I would I'd be very curious to talk to Mateo growing up with social media being baked into the model. Uh, and I I don't know how you guys as parents have interacted with it and how he's approached it. But like I, I got through high school without any social media. I feel like the people that came in right after me that had Facebook like front and center when they were in high school got screwed because no one up. knew how it worked They're yet. And, they, and, and like, I feel really sorry for them, but I think that we're now kind of like coming around the other side where it's like, Oh, okay. You know what? I'm going to not have my phone on when I'm at dinner. I'm just going to live in the moment. I'm going to be with my family. Uh, I'm not like, like I, like some, I talk to comedians about all the comedians. I know not all, a lot of them. First thing they do when they wake up in the morning is check their email, and check Twitter. And I'm like, don't do that. Like, like take, take an hour to captain your day and and like you tell the universe what you're gonna do with it and like what you're gonna get done don't don't be just receptive to other people the entire day and i i think we're gonna get to that point where we'll figure out how to do this we'll figure out how to build new communities and it might be that vr technology just gets so well that we remain friends with our high school buddies forever even if they're living in nam uh or even it, if it they're be, dead and they're just an ai bot yeah, we, we have an avatar <laughs> it, it, it might it might be that like i wouldn't surprise me if by the end of covid we we kind of go you know what i actually like i really miss physically seeing people i'm, I'm gonna get to know my neighbors i'm gonna i'm gonna get to join some book clubs in my area that might happen too well uh as as is my want i i um i like to run these suckers long <laughs> whether whether the audience sticks around the whole time or not um i think jesse even left <laughs> <laughs> she said getting ice cream she's gonna come yeah. back here in a minute yeah you're gonna hear like <laughs> she's drinking a milkshake from Amy's good chat guys loved it when you talked about politics good stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was i was in it for the star trek uh now i'm out i'm out well 
it was it was great to c- catch back up with you. Uh, Me too, John. Uh, wrap us out with where people can find you. Uh, people, check out my two podcasts, The Political Orphanage, which you've got a good flavor of based on our, our conversation today, and alienating the audience if you're willing to let your virginity grow back through high-octane science fiction. Those are the two podcasts, The Political Orphanage and Alienating the Audience. <laughs> let your virginity grow back through sci-fi. I love That's that. my promise to you. If you listen to three episodes, you get it back. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You're like, wow, I suddenly feel really uncomfortable in sweatpants. <laughs> I'm kind of twitchy. I'm twitchy. I've got a lot more energy than I'm used to, but it's like a very unfocused, jittery coffee energy. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Andrew, you're the best. Back at you, John. Um, let's speak to you again real soon. Okay, man. Right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Emergent Order podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app. If you're interested in being a guest, shoot us an email at podcast at emergentorder.com. Our producer is Jesse Bennett. Thanks again and speak to you next time.